all, my name is Ankit Gupta. I am representing IntelliCap today. Uh, I have been part of the energy and uh, climate change ecosystem and managing the energy and climate change operations for IntelliCap uh, in, in, in Asia and as well as in Africa. We have been, uh, we are here to have a quick uh, 60 minute panel discussion on scaling entrepreneurial energy solutions. We have been joined by esteemed uh, panelists uh, who will, and the session will be moderated by Mr. John Lane, Associate Director at Carbon Trust. Uh, I'll let John introduce the panelists, but uh, before that, I'll quickly want to run you down through the, through the agenda for today. So the agenda is that we will have a small introduction from John on the Energy Catalyst program that is uh, supported by Innovate UK, uh, followed by uh, three, uh, three, three esteemed panelists from that program, who are the entrepreneurs from that program who are getting support as part of the Energy Catalyst program. And they will share a brief about their organization and what kind of challenges they are facing and the type of ecosystem support that they need to scale and grow their solutions in other parts of the other parts of the world, including in Asia and Africa. Then we'll, uh, we'll join by Vivek Subramanian, who is a co-founder and executive director of Fourth Part Energy, one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the distributed energy segment and solar rooftop segments in India. And he, we will love to hear Vivek's view on scale and growth in Indian in India in Indian continent, um, and then we'll follow will be followed by a, a small uh, a brief by Samir Tirkar, principal responsibility investment, uh, who will share the investment perspective uh, on the renewable energy segment from the Asia and the Asia Pacific region perspective. We'll followed by uh, whatever questions you have during the questions we, we, we during the session, we'd like you to post that in the chat box window, and we'll ensure that all those questions will be taken up towards the end, uh, and and so uh, one of our uh, some of our panelists will be able to address the questions that you have towards the end. We'll ensure that uh, we'll have an engaging discussion with you as well. So please keep popping in the chat box with the questions, suggestions you have during the session. Without further ado, I would like to hand over the mic to John uh, to take it forward from here. Thank you, Ankit. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be uh, moderating this um, panel session um, today. Um, I'm really pleased that we've got three, five excellent guests. I think, Ankit, you've introduced the last two. So if you don't mind, I'll, um, I'll just move on to the ones that um, you haven't introduced, which is the three entrepreneurs from the Energy Catalyst. Yeah. So we have um, Simon Egofoss, who's the CEO of Pyrogenesis. Pyrogenesis has a waste biomass powered combined cooling heat and power technology and Simon really looking forward to hearing all about that. We also have Beth Larson who's um, co-founder and chief investment officer from Charm Impact. Charm Impact does crowdfunding for early stage entrepreneurs in developing markets. So looking forward to listening to you Bethany and then we also have Mr Akshat Kulkarni who's a co-founder of Auxagrid which is a company focused on energy optimization and IoT analytics. Um, just to introduce myself very briefly, I'm John Lane. I work for the Carbon Trust. I lead our work in energy access. There's a couple of things I do there. One, one I'm the director responsible for the Transforming Energy, energy Access program. And also I work quite a lot on the Energy Catalyst and my, my role for the Energy Catalyst specifically is looking to you know, support um, our entrepreneurs to engage in, uh, in, the, in, in the energy access ecosystem, including events like this. So I'm really pleased we've got such a good audience for these, uh, for these um for, the, for our cat catalyst companies to, to interact with. Um, so as we're already into some of our time, I'm, without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Simon. And Simon, you're gonna take us through, um, you're gonna take us through you know, a little bit, little bit about your organization, what the key offering and solutions you have, what your value proposition is, um, key market barriers and opportunities that you see in your sector and support you require from the ecosystem in order to scale your solution. So over to you, Simon. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Well, uh, <laughs> I didn't realize I was going to be going so soon. Um, well, Pyrogenesis is a company that I incorporated in 2017 um, after retraining as a chemical engineer as a mature student. Um, so I literally just uh, handed in my dissertation and, uh, you know, wanted to get involved in the, uh, you know, bioenergy and biofuel space. And um, the reason I retrained was I wanted to learn all about a technology called pyrolysis, uh, which is an advanced thermal technology that you can use, it acts as a, as a form of separation. And uh, what I realized is that, um, you know, from reading, you know, various papers, and it was pa a paper published by Professor um, Tony Bridgewater and Dr. James Dittenloy at Aston University that showed this technology, um, you can use any kind of waste, it's very feedstock flexible, you can separate it into its component parts, and then you can recombine that into liquid biofuels, solid biofuels, you can use that to generate um, heat and electricity, and biofuels. So I thought, well, if I can learn how to do that, um, I've got a company. And uh, so here we are kind of like nine, almost 10 years later now, and uh, Pyrogenesis has done just that. We've 
Um, I had to do a lot of stuff um, to, you know, find resources, raise, you know, uh, finance, uh, find grants that would fund um, and enable me to build a prototype, uh, which uh, we now have. Um, actually, if I can share my screen, I can give you a, a, a kind of like... Um, uh, Go ahead, Simon, you, yeah. Yeah, I can show you what it actually looks like, you know, um, because a lot of people are like, my goodness, you built that. And uh, so I'll just share my screen. Okay. Right. So it's a containerized technology, and that's really important for the USP. Uh, the chaps, so this is me, of course, and this is uh, um, Claudio Amoresi of ICMIA. It took me over two years to find this company, ICMIA. They're based in Italy. Uh, they have a UK uh, company as well. And, um, you know, and really um, what I needed was somebody who understood pyrolysis technologies, who understood building prototypes. Um, so myself and my team who invented this process and designed the process handed it over to Claudio, who then was able to uh, manufacture it. Okay, and we're uh, still working on developing it. Um, so it's important, you know, when you're saying about the journey, you have to find partners who can actually actualize and, you know, uh, and, and realize your dream. And they might have, and in my case, they had skill sets that we just didn't possess in, um, you know, in, in my team. So, um, and then of course, uh, we had managed to get so far using European funding to build the prototype, but it wasn't in the container at that time. And that was where Innovate UK came in very handy with the Energy Catalyst grant. And um, they provided us with additional resources that allowed us to partner with ICMIA to do more development work on the technology. They allowed us to identify international partners, um, you know, which meant that our target market is off-grid communities in Sub-Saharan Africa. We chose Nigeria as our primary market. We've got fantastic in-country partners in Nigeria as a result of the Energy Catalyst program. Um, that was all good and well. You know, we've learned a lot now about exactly what business model suits our um, technological offer, um, you know, by converting agricultural waste into, you know, process heat. Um, and then the process heat typically, which is used by um, food processors who are using those um, agricultural products. And we use the waste that they generate. So it's all a virtual circle. They need a lot of electricity as well. And then we've got another, we identified another offtake partner for biofuels. Um, now, identifying the offtake partner that has really made the biggest difference. And this is a partner who has, it's a, um, a, 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 an organization, a Nigerian company, a blue chip uh, PLC that turns over about 500 million a year. And um, to sit down and uh, uh, negotiate uh, to, uh, a letter of intent with them about what we wanted to achieve, that took the um, T program, of which John leads, um, you know, to get me to that position. So um, some of the barriers were, you know, we're not lawyers, we're chemical engineers in my team. So we needed some really good legal support. We needed help with structuring how we're going to bring a, 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 an agreement together with a, with a major customer who now wants us to install 100 of these units by the end of 2022. So um, it, helping to facilitate that conversation, it was essential, the program of support that we received uh, through the T program uh, and, and, you know, uh, and I must say, um, your colleague, John, Lisa Lafferty, is an absolute credit to, to the program and to Carbon Trust. Um, you know, because you get to work with people who um, they are very skilled at this. They've done it many times before and they, they show you the ropes. So we're getting legal support um, and advice. You know, uh, we've had excellent uh, support from Open Capital as well to help us really develop the business plan and our financial model. Uh, you know, working with my accountant, uh, Malcolm Veal, um, you know, very closely so that we can build an offer that, um, you know, investors recognize and, uh, you know, I can articulate it because first and foremost, I'm an entrepreneur. I dart off in all different directions. I'm a chemical engineer. I love to solve all these challenges, but I'm not an investment guy. Um, so really, um, some of the barriers that we faced is um, finding, you know, who to work with. Okay. And finding who to work with, if you don't have resources and you don't have anything interesting doing, that's really hard. So having the platform, like I've just showed you, um, and uh, really what's important about this platform, and this is what's significant about this platform. This is UKRI Innovate UK's Clean Growth and Infrastructure Annual Review for this year. Amazing. Where would I have got that from? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, 
you know, this is another thing. It's given us, uh, it's highlighted um, what we're doing to the rest of the world um, that, you know, there's been due diligence done on this organization. These guys are monitored very closely. I mean, everything we spend is, has to be receipted and it's accounted for. Um, we've got monitoring officers that, um, you know, really push us to really explain where we are at uh, in our journey, what we're doing, and we have to account for everything. So that's really good practice that effectively sets us up for investment readiness, due diligence, you name it. Um, you know, and we love collaboration. So um, collaboration um, is one of the hardest things to achieve if you have no resources and no platform and, and, and no, no, nothing to showcase where you're up to and no due diligence being done on you. Um, you know, the finance, there's a lot of people out there with, with, you know, with finance available, but they want to see certain things, uh, you know, certain pedigree in who they're dealing with. And I think that's what the programmes achieve. I hope that answers your question, John. Thank you, Simon. Thanks for such a brilliant and passionate um, explanation about your project and congratulations on, uh, on your progress so far. It sounds really exciting. It um, is. Great stuff. I'm going to move over now to, to, to Bethany from, uh, from Charm Impact. Bethany, um, again, we're going to, uh, I'll remind you of what we're going to chat about. Just a little bit about your organisation, you know, kind of what you do, you know, kind of what, what, are, what are the barriers and opportunities that you see? in growing your business and then what kind of support do you require from from the ecosystem in order for you to, to scale up great sounds good um well thank you john and thank you for having us it's um it's a great opportunity to be here and we're really excited to be able to share the work we're doing at charm with the sand kelp community so thank you um and hello everyone my name is beth and i am a co-founder as well as the chief investment officer at charm impact which is an impact investment platform that crowdsources small-scale debt for clean energy startups in emerging markets. We provide loans from 10,000 to 250,000 pounds at an 8% interest rate and are currently focused on Sub-Saharan Africa as well as South and Southeast Asia. So how we've differentiated ourselves from other debt providers in this space is that we focus on one of the earliest stages of the market um, what we've seen is that there are hundreds, if not thousands of entrepreneurs who cannot access the kind of capital that they need to grow their businesses because they fall into what's called the pioneer gap. So they are too big for microfinance, but too small for traditional investment. And what's happened is it's resulted in this massive financing gap for early stage investment, as well as a really problematic bottleneck for the entire market. So the vast majority of funding right now goes to a very few large foreign owned companies. Actually, Gogla, um, the Global Off-Grid Lighting Association just released a report that found that in 2020, of all of the capital that went to off-grid investments, 75% went to just three companies, right? Three companies. So it's a, a huge problem. And the reason why there isn't more investment at this stage of the market is that well, one, it, it can be costly, right? So if, if you're a traditional investment fund, it just does not make sense from a cost or time perspective to be writing checks for 10,000 um, pounds. It's also risky, right? So we are working with entrepreneurs who, you know, they're running new companies, testing new products and new markets. Um, and I guess, you know, the combination of things make it a, a difficult investment proposition. So what we do is, well, one, we're a crowdfunding platform. So we're not a traditional investment fund. Um, and two, we use what's called a blended finance approach. So for anyone who's not familiar with blended finance, it's pretty much just using different types of capital, blending different types of capital like debt and grants, for example, in order to create a financial instrument that, that makes sense for investments that don't fit into that traditional investment mold. So what we do is, with each loan, we will raise a portion of the loan from investors on our crowd. And then the rest is actually philanthropic capital. So that as our borrowers are repaying, investors are repaid first. And then as the loan progresses, if there is a default down the line, that philanthropic capital layer would take the first hit. And so this helps de-risk the investment for our investors. It makes the entire investment more attractive. Um, so that's how Charm works in a nutshell, I guess. We, we just closed our seed raise actually on Friday. Um, so we have a chunk of money now and are looking to grow quite quickly. Um, 
probably need a lot of things, but I guess our ask from this community would be three things. Um, one, pipeline. Uh, if you or anyone you know is running a company that you think would meet our investment criteria, we would love to chat with you. Um, philanthropic capital. If you are a grant provider that is interested in catalyzing investment into this space and would like to contribute to that blended finance model that I just men mentioned, um, we'd also love to speak with you. And then finally, last but not least, uh, investors. So <laughs> we are a crowdfunding platform. Um, so we need a crowd. If you are an individual that would like to use your money as a force for good, we would love to have you on board as an investor in, through our website. Um, and, or if you're an institutional investor um, and you're interested in testing this space, but maybe you, know, you can't write smaller tickets, we would love to chat with you about how we could take a larger pool of money and diversify it for you by spreading it across a number of companies in our portfolio. So with that, um, thank you for having us. I will include my contact details in the chat. And yeah, I hope to hear from some of you soon. Great. Thank you very much, Beth. And congratulations on your seed raise. What wonderful timing for this event. Thank That's you. Such, yeah. such, such, terrific, <laughs> such terrific news. Brilliant stuff. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Beth. OK, um, next up, we have um, Mr. Akshat Kulkarni co-founder of Auxagrid, a company that is um, supported by the Energy Catalyst and is, is active in the energy optimization and IoT analytics area. So over to you, um, Akshat. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is Akshat here. I'm the co-founder of Auxagrid. And as John said, yeah, we're a startup funded by uh, Innovate UK through the Energy Catalyst 5 program. We started the company back in 2017, mainly to address uh, various challenges in the electricity distribution sector. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just share my screen and I have a few slides which, which talk about what our system does. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions after that. And hopefully, there we go. Awesome, yeah. Yeah, so, so as I was saying, the, the area that we work in is, elect is that we work with electricity distribution companies, both in developing as well as developed countries. So the challenge that we see in countries like the UK is that the electricity distribution companies are having a very aging and risky asset base, and at the same time having to integrate new uh, distributed energy resources. And while countries like India and in some parts of Sub-Saharan Africa where we work, we see that the electricity distribution companies are having regular power outages and, and almost double digit electricity uh, losses, both technical as well as commercial losses. And at the same time, they have to uh, integrate more and more uh, customers who are who are you know who need electricity at this stage. So what we offer is a combination of sensors and analytics to monitor and analyze the electricity grid nodes. So we put our sensors. Uh, these are our sensors, IoT sensors. We install them at uh, the medium to low voltage sub substations to monitor the transformers, the electricity feeders, and so on. Um, we collect different data points, like different electricity data points, asset condition data points. Um, we, we display this on simple dashboards, which anyone in the electricity utility can use and understand where the problems are happening or where they might happen in the future. And if they do happen, what will be the impact, the financial and the, the uh, electrical impact to the network? So, so the core component that we have in the system is our, the analytics part, right? Once we obtain this data, uh, these are the different analytics that we provide. Uh, we, we categorize them into uh, fault analysis. So basically power outages, what is causing them, why, why these outages are happening. Uh, asset analysis, which is essentially uh, the assets, are they working efficiently? Have they been configured correctly? And will they have any issues in the future? And then finally, energy efficiency analysis, which is uh, basically detecting abnormal usage of electricity uh, detecting abnormal flows of electricity and essentially with all this make sure that the network is working as efficiently and with as few losses as possible. So the various barriers to entry in this sector are that uh, you know this the electricity distribution sector this is a you know it's a fairly legacy sector has been there forever right? and it's been dominated by very large providers that supply different uh, different SCADA systems. 
So the challenge that we face is how do we overcome this and how do we promote, how do we offer a solution to a sector which requires a different uh, regulations, restrictions, and so on. So what we do is we we work with we we work with the established uh, providers in the sector, and we because we offer something that is quite unique, right? Because rather than offering a legacy SCADA system, we have uh, simple to deploy IoT sensors, which don't require any sort of infrastructure upgrade or shutting down of the grid and so on, right? So these sensors are deployed within within a few minutes, and they start streaming data instantly. And then on the other side, on the software side, we made sure that the system doesn't require highly specialized people to use it. So we're trying to make it accessible for everyone in the utility. And with these, this, these two combinations, we've been able to deploy our system in different parts of India, as well as uh, a couple of locations in Sub-Saharan Africa as well. So uh, after this talk, you know, I'll share a link to our blog post where we've done a deployment in a rural part of India, uh, a part which previously was having um, almost 25% in electricity losses. Uh, we put our combination of sensors and analytics, and then through the system, the utility was able to identify the outages as soon as they happened. So they managed to drop down their power outage time from three hours to one hour. And also they managed to reduce their energy losses quite significantly through a combination of the, sens the, the sensors and the analytics. Um, we also did a project with Innovate UK where we built a system which was able to detect abnormal energy consumption or essentially power theft uh, when it happened. Uh, and while, and this, the uniqueness about the system was it did not rely on smart meters to be installed. Uh, it, instead, it looked at the data from the grid side and it built a machine learning algorithm which was able to predict when any sort of abnormal consumption was occurring and consumption that could be attributed to electricity theft. And with this, again, the network was able to effectively manage and, and stop these uh, leakage points from happening. Uh, these are sensors, the seed and stem devices that are deployed on site. And um, yeah, going forward, what we are looking for is again, uh, partners that will help us uh, take our solution set forward in and offer it in various other countries, as well as investors who are, you know, with whom we can partner with and again, build our system that can obtain the regulation, the, the regulatory requirements of the various countries and offer solutions in different parts of the world. So it's a short presentation. Thank you. And yeah, I'll drop the link right now. And again, any questions, just send me on the link and I'll be able to answer them right away. Thank you, Akshat. That's brilliant. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen, yeah. that would be terrific. Thank you. Um, brilliant. Thank you to all three of our entrepreneurs. I'm sure everyone will agree. Three very different, but very exciting bits of uh, bits of innovation um, there. Um, so now we're going to move on to a discussion of someone someone that's been there and done it. Um, so I'm very delighted to have uh, Vivek Submaranium from Fourth Partner Energy, one of India's largest companies in the distributed solar sector. He's going to share the success story of his company. So Vivek will give us a brief introduction um, to the organization. He'll give us some of the key drivers behind Fourth Partner's success and growth. Um, he'll talk about some of the major challenges faced by fourth uh, fourth partner energy and how how those were overcome. Um, so he'll talk about scaleless business models, scaling scalable business models, and the future growth strategy of the organisation. Um, so, without further ado, be back over to you. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, John. That sounds like an elevator pitch uh, to uh, to a VC uh, and a really short uh, elevator ride as well. Uh, I'll, of course, not be able to cover all of those. Uh, I will try and touch upon all of those, but I will actually keep it brief so that I can encourage some questions from, from the audience uh, as well. Um, thank you, first and foremost, IntelliCamp for giving us this opportunity. Uh, delighted to be here and always delighted to be at Suncalp every year. Uh, fourth Partner Energy last week celebrated its 10th year. And I think when John meant been there, done it, he's basically saying you managed to bloody survive for 10 years. And I, I think that's, that's honestly our... Uh, that's what gives us a lot of thrill. Uh, I think in this sector where you have um, some of the world's largest investors, you have some of India's largest groups all vying with each other to try and make a mark um, and, and, um, uh, uh, and, and in, a, in a sector where the Indian electricity authorities are themselves getting their head around where it needs to move and how it needs to move. The fact that we survived for 10 years is something that we take a lot of pride in. Uh, so we may have done a few things right, and all I'm trying to do is to share some of those. Uh, I'll put that in context that this is A, about us, and, 
and the space we operate in don't know how much of these learnings can actually be uh, can be deployed by other industries or related industries but i'm i'm trying to make it as generic as i can be i think uh, fourth partner energy from when it started uh, as you can imagine solar energy was about 18 rupees a unit uh, we are at yeah less than five four to less than four times that now uh, and and that um, that was something we predicted we felt strongly about uh, but obviously had to bide our time and wait till uh, those prices came about. And uh, in that journey of 10 years, what we've tried to do is, uh, you know, the, uh, to take the theme of survival beyond uh, the obvious meaning of the word survival is to sort of innovate on the business models, on the propositions to our customers, is to keep being flexible, changing things around uh, and, and making sure that the value to the customer continues to be delivered through. I think the... Um, uh, what we've achieved today is about just to draw that out. We have, you know, we've implemented about 450 odd megawatts across uh, across India and some parts of Asia. Um, uh, we've uh, we have 300 people uh, as what we call our fourth partners, our employees, uh, and they are across 11 offices in India. And now we are in Sri Lanka, um, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, and uh, and also Myanmar. Um, and, and these have been a new forays, and I think that's one of the subject points that was also asked to be covered, and I'll quickly touch upon those as well. Um, how could, uh, what, you know, a few learnings uh, or what we think we got right, I think, needless to say, uh, this is not a management uh, lecture, but everybody will agree that more than anything else, it's the team, isn't it? I think it's about making sure you get um, equally uh, crazy uh, guys alongside you uh, who are passionate about this sector, uh, who who are as nimble and flexible as you are, uh, who uh, who probably are not going to be just innovators and and be the first one out there, but will definitely be one of the first who learn from the first ones out there, if not the first one out there. And I think the one thing that we all have to uh, put onto the table very transparently is that the renewable energy sector is uh, is is so transformative and is changing so um, so fast that. It is practically impossible for us to fight the battle on all fronts and collaboration, knowing what's happening out there, knowing what other competitors are doing um, and learning from that and being nimble and flexible has been, uh, has been the one common thread that we'd love, definitely like to um, take pride in and, and feel that our team's um, uh, done phenomenally well. Um, learn from it, move, act. Actually, we, we keep telling our team that, you know, let's make some calls, let's take some mistakes. Uh, but keep moving, you know, and and get some get a few things done. Um, the the business models also, I mean, uh, to give you a sense, we started by first selling solar lanterns and home lighting systems. Uh, then figured that you know we got to move into the project side of the business. We started building an EPC outfit. Uh, saw that the whole of India uh, or the Indian uh, bureaucracy and government was investing into large scale utility solar, whereas we were trying to be distributed with commercial industrial customers. Uh, felt, um, you know, is it something that we need to sort of look out for, uh, dipped our leg, did a project there, quickly realized that's not what we want to do. We want to stay CNI focused, came back. We could see why customers will want to pay as you go or an OPEX model. Uh, we didn't have the monies. We, uh, we you know, we innovated. We tried to find an ability to, uh, to own solar assets off our balance sheet, uh, found good partners uh, who, who helped us through that process. And when all of this sort of made sense and we sort of closed up, you know, some angel rounds in between, some VC rounds in between, and then we finally felt comfortable that we could make the migration through to becoming a developer, raise some money later on for, for the same as well. Uh, so being that, you know, having that ability to move around is equally important uh, in this space. Um, the other thing that I will, uh, I will bring to light is definitely good financiers. Uh, I, I think this space needs financiers to be as flexible uh, and anybody, any financier who holds on to an original business plan uh, or the, um, you know, or the direction of the plan is also going to be phenomenally upset because it's not going to stick to that. Uh, and we've, we've had some great financiers alongside. Uh, shout out to one of them who's here on the forum with us, Samir, thank you. Uh, and we've done three rounds of funding from, from responsibility and uh, we keep going back to them uh, and to all our other financiers as well, which has been, uh, which has been great. So I think get good quality financiers who understand the space, who who are willing to be as flexible uh, with you, and then of course treat them right, uh, and and make sure you're honest, transparent, forthcoming with uh, with what's going right and wrong with them, so that they feel the comfort as well. 
Uh, look, there are plenty of other learnings. I'll stop at this because this really is the uh, crux of it all, but happy to take any more questions. And I'm sure I missed 10 other things that we could have shared with you all. I think on the question of scale, um, clearly uh, the one thing that we've always believed in is that scale needs to be achieved alongside profitability. So, you know, we finished 10 years of our operations. Every single year of our operations, we have been proud to be a net profitable, not just uh, profitable, we've been net profitable. And that's something that we never compromised on in terms of saying let's achieve scale at, at the expense of profitability is not something that, that we were prepared to do. Uh, and I, I just think that that's a conversation then it becomes much easier to have with your financiers because if they don't see that those numbers materializing, they get a bit nervous or jittery, or at least I'm against putting in context the industry I am in, which is in India. Uh, where, where financiers are a little bit more conservative from that account. Um, to achieve scale, we simply focused on being customer centric. Um, and, and that's the one mantra more than anything else. We just said, let's stick with our customer and say, what is it that we can bring to the table uh, that we haven't got to them already? So are we a solar power generating company? We said no, uh, even though we have 2000 plants across India uh, and we have that's 2000 points of presence. Therefore, across India, we said, uh, that's not sufficient. Let's leverage on that point of presence. Look at ourselves as an energy management company and ask ourselves what else we can do with some of these customers. Quickly realize that we could supply a larger chunks from an offsite source. Um, before we move from on-site to off-site, customers have an interim plan. You go and talk to the Coke and Pepsis of the world, all of whom are, are our customers. They say they have, a, they have a vision. They want to achieve what they want to achieve by, say, 2025. And we said, we can help you achieve that even with short-term trading solutions. So we even built a trading desk inside our uh, team so that we can partner with our customers and give them uh, some more of what they need. Um, then found that these same customers have transportation needs, which can be met with electric vehicles. They have finally energy storage needs that we are, we are serving them and so on and so forth. But, um, and, and, and for some of them uh, who are, uh, you know, the large multinationals, the Unilevers of the world, they are also across multiple Geography. So we said, why, why only stop in India? We'll, and we follow you to some of your neighboring markets as well. And they were they have all uh, willingly obliged. And um, this customer centricity is something that we we love, enjoy, talk about, and and manage very carefully. To give you a sense, every year about one third to forty percent, and that's the target we set to our team. Of our uh, sales comes from our existing customers. So it's you know it's just that it becomes that much easier also when your existing customers who are growing as well uh, as they should be also support your growth plan to go alongside. Asia and growth plans, um, quick uh, aspects there. I think most of Asia looks up to India in terms of what has already been achieved. And I think that's a good position for a lot of Indian entrepreneurs in, uh, in this forum. Uh, so go out there, show your skills, show your credentials, uh, show your capabilities, and, and you will be surprised at how much they, um, uh, they value that. Uh, we we've, we've been pleasantly surprised to that extent to see um, that you know there uh, in terms of us and our nearest competitors in some of the markets the scale differential in terms of what we've already achieved in India is so stark uh, that it makes conversations much easier. So this is mostly there's a therefore a skill deficiency that you can fulfill, but if not that you also can fulfill a capital deficiency. So if you have good quality investors in India who are ready to back you or in your home market, sorry, I, I speak from an Indian context who can also back you in some of these neighboring markets, that also makes your job easier. And you can therefore create the momentum in those markets that much more. Um, there will be obviously certain nuances on what customers prefer uh, there uh, to what uh, the customers here prefer, but our mantra has always been, you know, uh, there should be a cost uh, reduction value impact to the customer. So, and, and, and only then you go and measure the impact, which is the clean and green side of the business. So if there is no, we walked away from contracts if we felt that the customer's uh, value uh, is limited or he's not as much in the money as, as would make the contract safe. You know, So we walked away from such contracts to make sure the customers are in the money. If they're not, don't bother with that kind of business. It's not sustainable. We are all in the 20, 25 year business. So it has to be a sustainable outcome. The um, uh, uh, other couple of lessons and I'm conscious of time. I have another two minutes there. Um, uh, 
go overboard on on raising capital be it debt or equity uh, there is you, there i don't think there is ever a situation where we can look back and say we were overfunded i don't think that will ever happen in this space you know what to do with your monies uh, so i know i sound a bit like you know um, if you don't have bread to eat you should eat cake but i'm just saying go out and raise as much capital as you can these are bet much better times than the times we raised our capital in so it can be done guys um, i think the other aspect is that look out for innovative financing products because we really need to change the the outlook of what traditional debt equity and mezzanine capital looks like you know they really have to be tailor made to where the industry is going and the kind of challenges that are seen uh, in the in the in these markets so go out speak to your financiers and help them innovate products and i'll give you an example we um, we dealt with a with an nbfc called manavia finance here in in hyderabad which is a, a arm of oiko credit from amsterdam a very traditional lender has been uh, it's the first time they did reno in, uh, renewable energy financing was with us and we really pushed the envelope between europe and here to try and um, get them to own our assets and claim depreciation which is a completely innovative financing scheme for something that they have never done anywhere in the world uh, and and it took time but when it happened you know they they catered to a big chunk of my capital needs and and that was really helpful um, over invest in your team I, uh, there is no money is that is sufficient for that uh, careful don't overpay i meant over invest so get more people on board and uh, and the last point sorry that i wanted to share was while for example we are in the cni space and and our customers are therefore private customers uh, most people may turn back and say you therefore don't have to deal with regulators but that's not the case i cannot imagine a, a, a business in the um, in the in the in the renewable energy space where you shouldn't have a strong interface with the uh distribution companies with the regulators with the uh with the government uh in whichever form and shape you have to keep educating them you have to keep working with them and making sure you address their concerns as well uh, to a large extent uh, in whichever form and shape you can so uh, it's a fallacy to think that you can work that in isolation you cannot work with your um with your partners i am going to stop here uh, i hope i was in time john thanks everyone for this opportunity that was brilliant. Thank you very much, Vivek. Really, really fascinating um, to hear your your experiences. And we'll we'll have some questions for you, I'm sure, towards the end of the of the session. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Samir Tiakar. Samir works for Responsibility, where he is um, a principal. Um, Samir is going to give us a perspective from the from the investment side. So, Samir, very happy to have you on this panel. And over to you. Hey, thanks, John, uh, and thanks, Vivek. To I think a lot of points I'm going to say right now would feel like a repetition of what Vivek said, but it's it's the same point from the other side, right? And and having worked with Vivek, I don't know, I'll, I'll I kind of agree with most of the points that he made regarding team and and kind of investing in team. So let me first quickly talk about responsibility, so that people get an idea of where we are coming from. Uh, responsibility is a Swiss asset manager. We are focused on development investments. Uh, with a track record of around 17, 18 years now. We currently manage around three and a half billion dollars of development capital across three main verticals, uh, financial inclusion, sustainable food and climate finance. Uh, now in climate finance, which is the more relevant one to over here, uh, we manage close to a billion dollar of uh, capital, uh, primarily debt capital as of now. Uh, and what we do is two things. We a large portion of our capital actually is for green lending or indirect lending, where we lend to local banks and institutions in emerging countries for uh, on lending for renewable energy, energy efficiency, and energy access. Uh, that's an advantage of being a global fund is that we are not restricted by geography. We can cater to Asia, you know, be Southeast Asia, South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, even Latin America. Uh, then from our funds, we also do a lot of direct lending. Uh, again, our focus areas includes APAC and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, two diverse markets, but still uh, having their own uh, needs in terms of specialized financing in the climate finance space. Uh, like I said, it's it primarily been lending for us. Well, like uh, the advantage of being a global lender, like I said, is we can uh, take lessons from one of the markets where we operate and try and implement in other regions, right? So, I'll give you an example. Like, like Vivek said, India is a leader on the CNI solar space, right? So, what we started doing in India, we then we are now exporting it across Southeast Asia. So, we started doing distributed solar energies, 
financing around four, four, five years back when it was not so mainstream, right? And the sector was not so big. So at that point of time, we kind of invested in early stage companies, including Ford Partner. And the learnings that we have from those early stage investing, now we are trying to use that same model for companies in Africa, which are at a similar stage where companies in India were around five years back. Uh, similarly, we are trying to expand what we did on the portfolio side across Southeast Asia to new markets like Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia. So as a lender also, we have to be very flexible. We have to keep learning and we have to keep adapting the kind of uh, financing we offer. Right? We are not traditional banks. It's, it's, we don't have a steady product. We have to kind of keep our ears close to the ground, understand the financing need and come up with products. Uh, which helps us kind of get capital from other institutional investors. In a way, we, we are quite close to what uh, Beth said about Charm, right? So at a slightly larger scale, we are also trying to focus large institutional money into slightly more diverse uh, investment area. So we, we have to be quite uh, flexible in that sense. Uh, our focus areas or strategies of what we want to invest is CNI solar or distributed solar is a key kind of area of interest for us. Energy access in Africa, again, is a big area of interest for us. Uh, we are lenders to most of the leading companies over there. Uh, increasingly, we are trying to focus on energy efficiency because we see that's a gap that's there in the market. Not a lot of companies in that space, not a lot of financing available in that space. So that is an area of interest for us. Uh, to give you an example, we kind of lend to a wastewater treatment company uh, last year, which was offering energy efficient treatment solutions to large industrial clients. And they were with our financing, they were able to offer that on a lease kind of a solution, right? So it's not about just having the product, you have to have innovative financing available so that that product can actually scale up. Uh, so energy efficiency is, is big for us. Uh, and, and that when I say energy efficiency, it's, it's quite big, right? Any technology that be it recycling, be it efficient IoT based systems that uh, reduce your wastage, all those things fall under energy efficiency. And I think the last vertical that we are evaluating would include electric mobility, still very early days, but you know, if, if we invest time and energy now, I think we, you know, it might become investable in 12 to 18 months. That's the way uh, we see uh, how the sector will evolve. Uh, what else? In terms of what we talk to about entrepreneurs and what we look for is, I think you know, having a great product is great, but having a great team is even better. You know, because the markets are evolving so much. You know, if if you are just looking at one single product, uh, it it might kind of give you a great start, but then you shouldn't lose sight or you have to keep evolving. So I think what we look for is. Uh, the kind of team that's there. And I don't mean just the founders of a company, right? So they, you know, that's also important, but then you should have a very good uh, top management in place, right? So th those are the people who will really help you scale your business. Uh, founders might have great idea on the product, but you will have to do operations. There's maintenance, there's marketing, there are hundreds of other uh, small operational details where you need expertise and you need good people to support in, in growing the business. So as a lender, we will not, just look at the product and the founder, we would also kind of invest in the team that's there. Uh, second, I think what we see in the market these days a lot is, is you know, the promoters shouldn't spread themselves too thin, right? Trying to do everything, trying to cater to every market at the same time, you might have a great product, but then uh, it's best to demonstrate the scale in a particular region, in a particular country before you start kind of spreading yourself across five, six countries or, or, or even different continents, you know, that really, makes uh, investors quite nervous whether you'll be able to pull off that. Uh, and I think just to repeat the points that Vivek already mentioned that being transparent with your investors is also a key thing and being realistic on what your timelines are gonna be, right? So if you think you're gonna raise capital in six months, please budget for 12 months because that's the amount of time it would take. Your business should not stop because there has been a delay in fundraising. So, you know, there should be some capability to plan for contingencies. So I think that's also a key, key issue that we see in these markets because we are dealing with, in, in a lot of cases, you know, the entrepreneur is, is, is very good, but they come from a product background, right? For them, sometimes they're not able to appreciate the nuances that a lender or financier needs in, in a business. Uh, so that's the reason you know, I will stress upon kind of building in 
buffers uh, you know be it excess capital being grow you know kind of slowing down your growth if you don't have capital these are things that you should be mindful of i think that's about it from my end uh, anything else or uh, we can open it for questions you know that will give people the chance to participate as well thank you samir for that was uh, super terrific and very helpful um i'm sure the energy catalyst companies found it very instructive and uh, and, and helpful as well um so let, let's let's do move to questions so i've got a few questions here that i'm gonna um um going to ask maybe there's one on um for, for each of the entrepreneurs maybe they could just give us a minute each on you know what what are the sub, what are the challenges you you expect to face in scaling your organization so maybe if i could ask where we go in the same order perhaps simon you could give us a minute of what, what what do you see as the biggest challenge that you're facing um well i think um it's uh, you know a couple of uh, you know things that came up and um you know we've got a new technology and, um, you know, to scale up, we need a asset finance would be ideal, but because it's a new technology, it's not really um, so proven in the marketplace. So who do we get to take on that risk? Uh, because they say, yeah, well, we might buy these containers, um, but how do we sell them if it all goes wrong? Um, so uh, that's really one of our key challenges that I've got to be uh, working on and, and sorting out is how do we finance the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 provide us the resources that we need to build each of these um, units and then send them out and deploy them in the field. Um, one of our key bottlenecks um, is also about training the staff who are going to operate them. And that bit actually I've got quite well under control, um, you know, through things like the Kickstart program in the UK that the government is financing, you know, training and investment. Um, so yeah, I think um, asset finance of our equipment and getting enough capital so that we can build each unit. And because uh, I've got to get 100 units into the field by the end of 2022, how am I going to fund, fund that? So any any um, uh, advice or assistance with that? Very happy to speak with people. Thank you, Simon. That's 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 great. How, how about you, Beth? What, what, what's your kind of the big thing that you, you're facing? So I would say our biggest challenge is probably that so we have three customers, right? Like we have the investors that we're trying to bring in to invest in our projects. We have the projects, so the entrepreneurs themselves, and then also grant providers because we need to build out this philanthropic capital pool. So it's a lot to manage at once. Um, and we are going to be hustling a lot to build out all these different streams. Um, and I think I actually just saw a question um, asking about a quick answer on you know what didn't fit from traditional financial structures. Um, I, I mentioned it briefly that um, writing small tickets doesn't really work from a cost or time perspective for a traditional investment fund, and that's because you know if you're a traditional investor, um, each deal comes with a number of legal um, and like other fees, right? It's a lot of paperwork, it's a lot of time as well. So it just writing a ten thousand pound check doesn't really make sense. And so that's why you see with a lot of investors, you know, their sweet spot might be a million to 5 million plus. Um, so yeah, writing these smaller checks, just, it's really challenging um, for, for a traditional funder. Thank you, Beth. Aksha, over to you. What's, what's the main, what, what's the main challenge you, you need to overcome say in the next 12 months? Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, for us, the big challenge is that we work with uh, large electricity distribution companies. Uh, many of them are, are, are big monopolies and and highly, highly, highly regulated. Oh, my video's off. And highly regulated as well, right? So the big challenge is convincing them to try out a new technology, to work with a startup that has an innovation, innovative idea with them, you know, to, to basically give us a chance to, to, demonstrate, you know, so to let us demonstrate our capabilities and then based on that, try to get a larger contract, right? So in order to overcome this, um, we are trying to partner with with uh, companies that have established relations with the electricity distribution companies in, in the target countries that we're working in. And also finding the investors who can back us that will you know, give us the funds to grow our teams and have those resources that we need to reach our end customers quickly. Great, thank you. Thank you, Akshat, that's, uh, that's a great answer. Um, Question for Samir um, from, from the audience, which is an interesting one. So what are the kind of innovative um, financing models of renewable energy 
um, that you're seeing now that you think might become mainstream over the coming years, uh, Samir? So what we see now is, is you know, not purely innovation, but trying to take traditional finance products to these sectors, right? Now you look at securitization, that's been there for ages, but now we are trying to do securitization even at uh, you know, companies which are in the energy access space. You are getting off balance sheet structure. So these are, you know, these are not new structures, but these are new structures for new businesses. So I think that is something, you know, and if you're able to successfully do that, that might open a new pool of capital for these companies and then kind of help them scale, uh, you know, achieve scale. I think that is one area where we focus to do an example on, on the distributed solar or the CNI solar space. Also over there, you have now different types of capital coming and you have people who want to do only asset financing, right? So that is long-term financing from 10 to 15 year kind of project loans for a portfolio of assets. People are trying to do uh, sub debt or mezzanine financing for a portfolio of assets. You know, once you have an operating set of operating assets, you can do, and then the cash flows are more or less kind of proven. You can do a sub debt on those assets, get get more for more capital against those assets. You know, you are doing working capital loans for promoters, and even over there, right? You don't come with with a single product that this is a product. Oh, no, I, I have a three-year loan. You have to take this. This is the only product I have. You try and tailor your offering to the kind of business that you are trying to support. Now, if it's a leasing business that has leasing contracts of seven, eight years, you will offer them financing solutions of five, four to five years. Now, if it's working capital requirement or it's order-based financing, these are then, again, short-term kind of uh, loans that you would offer such kind of companies. So, uh, there is no new product that's coming in. I think, like I said, one is we are trying to be more flexible depending on what business we are kind of uh, trying to finance. And second is trying to get these uh, financing products, which are mainstream into these new business models. Thank you, Samir. That's, that's, that's really interesting. Very helpful. Um, I'm going to wrap up the questions now with a question for Vivek. Um, and you can, first of all, Vivek, you can tell me whether you agree with the statement that's, that's contained in the question. So the statement is, um, India's distributed solar segment has lagged behind significantly. Brackets rooftop segment is at three gigawatts only. Um, so first of all, you can tell us whether you agree with that. And then, um, and then the, the question is, what innovative strategies can be used to fast track capacity deployment? Without doubt, it is, I agree with that statement. It was supposed to be 40 gigawatt or 10 times that if you, if you put that in context in the next year or so. But I think Look, uh, when the target was made, people scoffed at it and said it's ridiculous. Um, I think it's spurred the growth of the industry by 50-60% a year. Now, if you sort of normalize that growth, it's not a bad option to have. Most of the people sitting in developed markets uh, would love that kind of growth. Um, should we have done more? Oh, without doubt, yes. What is the limiting factor? To a large extent, it is... Um, uh, it is the regulators in the, in the sense that we are eating into the business of the distribution companies and their meatiest customers, um, and, and they are resisting it as much as they can. There are limitations on how much capacity you can put up if you want net metering installed. There are certain limitations on, uh, on installation uh, in certain states, et cetera. So the story is, um, is still evolving, uh, but, you know, sorry, if you... Uh, and most of us will agree on this one. If you sort of, you know, you take a 10 year view and say, you know, the, the graph's been acute and, and that's what you want to see, um, which is why what we have done in terms of managing that risk of surprises that may come is to be as distributed as we can. One of the advantages of the distributed strategy is the fact that uh, is what we've tried to learn from and say, let's ourselves be distributed. You know, it's not just about the energy sector getting de-risked. It's why don't we de-risk ourselves as well? So made sure that we're spread across different states in India, we are in other countries as well. So, you know, if, if the opportunity doesn't work out in one or two states in India, because uh, the distribution company there is resisting it for the shorter term, uh, we are confident we can make do the business plan from our other markets, while at the same time working with those distribution companies and explaining to them that, you know, this is not a story that they can uh, bottle back uh, in. It's something that that whose time has come and, and, and will happen. So. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Vivek. And thanks everyone for your questions. If, if I didn't get to your question, I, I do apologize um, We're because we're, we're, we're out of time now. So it's just time for me to, to wrap up quickly. I'd obviously like to thank each of our panelists, um, the entrepreneurs, 
uh, Vivek from the Been There Done It uh, perspective and also from, from Samir for the, the investment perspective. Thank you all very much. Thank you to Entelecap for organising this event and, um, and uh, I really enjoyed moderating the session. So with that, I'll hand back to Prachi to close. Thank you so much, John. This was uh, a very, very important session for, for uh, uh, the entrepreneurs in the audience and in the panel, and uh, as well as for all of us supporting uh, the ecosystem. A big shout out to Energy Catalyst uh, that's supporting uh, the session and uh, to Akshat, uh, Beth and Simon for sharing the solutions uh, that you are working on. And also to uh, Vivek and Samir for uh, some very, very valuable takeaways for uh, our entrepreneurs who are looking to scale their solutions and uh, those who are looking to raise capital in the market. Thanks again for being here.